Hello everyone and welcome to this next in our series of panel discussions about some of our repertory shows. Um, this week we are talking about our production of Dorian Gray, um, which was first seen in 2008 and 2009, I think 2009 was the last time it was seen in the, U the UK. We've got an amazing panel here to discuss the piece today. Uh, four original cast members. We have Richard Windsor, who created the role of Dorian. We have Michaela Miazza, who created the role of Lady H. And we have Christopher Marnie, who created the role of Cyril Vane. And we have Drew McConey, who created several roles in the piece, was an ensemble member. And now, of course, you all know him as a world famous choreographer. Um, but he was in the original production. Um, so it's great to have you all here, folks, um, to discuss this piece. It's something that I, I think meant a lot to all of us at the time. As, um, as you were just saying, we, we're gonna try and jog our memories uh, a little and try and remember from 10, 11, 12 years ago, um, what we were doing. <laughs> I think it's, we'll, we'll, we'll be okay, we'll be okay. It'll come, it'll come flowing back. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, this piece, it was done some time ago, so any new fans to the company will not have seen it. We do get quite a lot of requests to do it people who've seen little clips of it on, the, on our um, YouTube channel, etc. Um, it's based on Oscar Wilde's famous novel, The Picture of, uh, of Dorian Gray. Um, it's uh, the, the, the novel, if you remember, if you've, if you've read it or seen film versions of it, or, the, um, or play versions of it, is about a young, a beautiful young man who's painted by an artist called Basil Hallward, who, um, I paints this amazing portrait of him and the story goes a big portrait uh, is is holding the secrets to Dorian's soul in many ways and it's the, the portrait starts to change as Dorian's uh, life becomes more depraved and evil and it, the the uh, portrait changes he keep, ends up keeping the portrait in his attic famously and um, as Dorian remains young while the pic picture gets old. Um, and it's, 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 sort of, it's about an obsession with youth and beauty and about uh, narcissism, I suppose, in some ways. We uh, felt that we could tell a different kind of story with this sort of dark fairy tale. Um, uh, Dorian making a pact with the devil. We felt it had a very uh, contemporary, very contemporary themes were still very relevant in the piece of what I just said, the, the obsession with youth has never been more prevalent than it is today. And when I say today, I'm talking 2008 when we made the piece, but probably things haven't changed that much. We decided to set it in the world of um, fashion and uh, more specifically photography and Basil Hallward, the artist becomes a photographer, a famous photographer. Uh, Dorian becomes a sort of it boy who uh, has a publicity campaign built around him with a new fragrance and that's just one of the things he does he becomes a very famous person they become a famous couple even basil and dorian um the other influence in his life in our version is a character called lady h i'm sure mccain will talk about her shortly she's she is our version of, of lord henry in the novel um we felt there were possibly too many male characters in this piece. We needed a strong female character and Michaela certainly fitted the bill there. Um, and he's, she's the other influence on his life. And uh, he has a sort of dual affair with the two, with these two main characters. And uh, as I say, it's a cautionary tale. It's about what fame does to you. Um, again, very relevant. It, it, it was a sort of, uh, for me, a sort of perfect uh, reinterpretation of something that was very, uh, familiar to many people, that novel. And we had a new score for it by Terry Davis, who was a, a, one of our associate uh, artists. A uh, completely new score. Les Brotherston, of course, designed the piece brilliantly. Paulie Constable lit the piece. And we had Paul Grutus on sound. It was a much smaller cast than we normally have. We were I think maybe about 12, something like that. I don't know exactly, something, wasn't it, in the cast. Those shows tend to be much more, um, the cast tend to bond very quickly and, and work together in a very um, unified way from, from an early point in the production and the rehearsals. Uh, and they're always great uh, memories for people, I always think, where a smaller production always has a different sort of feel about it. I'll come to you in a second, guys. I'm just going to give people a little background to the, we opened the show in the Edinburgh Festival 
uh, was a commission from the Edinburgh Festival in uh, August 2008. It, it actually ended up being the most successful dance production in the history of the Edinburgh Festival in terms of audience figures. Don't know whether it still is, it possibly is. We did a short tour that year. We played a sad as well summer season. Um, and that was the original intention for the piece. And then we had some success with it. So we returned with it the following year, uh, in 2009, with some, diff some changes to the cast. And we took it to around the UK, a lot more, a lot more around the UK. We went to Italy and Moscow, um, strangely, especially with the laws in Moscow, the subject matter of this piece. We might want to talk about that later. Um, and we did a second uh, Sad as Well season, including a midnight matinee. Was that the first time round? It was the first, first time. time. I think it was the first yeah. time. Yeah. And I remember Joan Rivers came, which yeah. was bizarre, but wonderful, because she was so nice. Liquid <laughs> <laughs> energy in the, in the audience, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. kind of heated and raunchy, for sure. Yeah, she loved it. And she yeah. stuck around afterwards and everything. It was great. Real we surprise. Um, it did have one reincarnation in uh, uh, 2013 when we did do the production for eight shows only in Tokyo with um, a mixture of uh, a few British dancers, including uh, Richard and, and Chris, a mostly Japanese cast who we sort of passed the show on to. And it's not been seen since, so we can talk about that later as well. But first of all, I wanted you each to sort of give us a little bit of information about your, your characters and um, tell us a little bit about how they worked in this piece, what the, how they uh, uh, fed into the story of this piece and, and how they related to the novel. So. Richard, or Dickie as I call him folks, I have to, might have to call him Dickie for now on. Uh, Dickie, can you yeah. give us the first, uh, uh, talk about Dorian a little bit? Yeah, I mean Dorian, um, like Matt was saying in the uh, original novel, was kind of this young uh, English gent in the kind of Victorian times that sold his soul to the devil um, for youth and, um, and, the power, and the power he loved to kind of yield with his youth and beauty. Um, so we, we set it obviously in, in a modern day and um, he was this uh, waiter at the beginning of the show, uh, just kind of a nobody really, um, that I guess had this kind of, had an air about him of um, a natural beauty. And, and he was a kind of an innocent, I guess, at the beginning. Kind of an, and I, I like to see him as a, at the start of the show, an innocent but yet, un, yet discovered sociopath. And that's how I kind of saw him. He kind of had all these kind of, bubbling um, uh, ideas about himself, but kind of probably didn't have the kind of outlet to express himself until he was discovered uh, by the photographer, Basil Hoard. Uh, yeah, and um, so he discovered him at the end of this um, uh, gallery opening and shined a light on him. And it was almost like the audience could see his, his beauty. But at that stage, we don't know if it's inner beauty, outer beauty, um, and it awoke something, I think, in Dorian um, at that stage. And through that, there's a, there's a, through that section, Basil thinks he has the power, I guess, and he starts seducing Dorian. But really, wow. we're kind of unsure as an audience member, really, who has the power at any point. And Basil, I guess, starts seducing him, taking his clothes off. But throughout it, we see that Dorian starts to enjoy it. And that awakens something in him. Um, and at one point, he gets hold of the camera and forgets about what's going on with Basil and just looks through the lens and kind of gets realizes a switch goes off in his mind that that's the window to fame and power and in turn everlasting life or beauty, everlasting beauty, not life. So I guess for me, for as, as I kind of approaching it as an actor, doing a lot of research, um, things that suggested between, you know, Matthew and the cast and things, but I also looked at American Psycho, uh, Patrick Bateman in American Psycho, the character, which was Brett Easton Ellis uh, novel and then made into a film with um, Christian Bale. Christian Bale. Uh, and his kind of depravity of, uh, well, certainly the, certainly the time I think helped the piece, didn't it? The kind of the elitist depravity of the time, the entitlement uh, of the time. I think that really helped me as, as Dorian kind of take that uh, through the early parts of the piece and kind of the discovery of fame and being able to manipulate those around him and then the downfall of him, the kind of the, the, the picture that is used for the, um, uh, the advertising, for the, for the fragrance, the immortality we called it or something? 
Immortal. 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 Yeah, the Immortal. fragrance for the, the poster was called Immortal, which obviously had double meanings. Um, and that kind of degraded throughout the piece. And that, I guess for me as an actor, represented the inner workings of him underneath the facade of beauty that he held for times, you know, for times go by you know, as the future goes. But the inner depravity that works for the character and the journey of his downward spiral, I think for me was him in a nutshell, I guess. That's a lot. <laughs> oh, come on, sorry. Well, actually, I remember the... Holding on to that for 10 years. I'm kidding. <laughs> the immortal picture that we have in, yeah. that, that represents his advertising campaign, in the second half, it gets torn away and it just says mortal. Yeah. Which mortal. makes it like he's not, he's not immortal. He's, he's just human in the end. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's great. We'll touch on some of those things later, Dick. Yeah. Uh, Michaela, how about Lady H? So, yes, I play the character of Lady H or Lady Henrietta, based on Lord Henry Wotton uh, in the book. She is uh, the senior editor of Arts Magazine or a media sort of um, company. So in the show, we called it the uh, White Box Media. And she is very passionate about art and artists and she discovers new artists, uh, new talent. Uh, she's very influential with new trends and she's very powerful in the art scene but also in the fashion scene. So it's in that sort of place between fashion and art. Um, she's very magnetic and she's um, feminine but in a very uh, androgynous sort of way. I felt when I watched again the show, um, I was reminded of a lot of details and the fact that at the beginning um, she appears quite um, harsh and ruthless, um, cold. And I remember um, um, at the beginning of the show, she's maybe a bit jaded with the scene and maybe a bit bored of what's going on in the arts world. And she discovers Basil, um, turns him into, is up to me actually, I, I turn him into a very, very um, popular, famous uh, photographer. And then actually when Dorian enters the scene, uh, there's a real shift. And I think for Lady H is the moment where there's sort of fresh air, fresh energy. And not only from a um, sort of um, creative, inspiring point of view, but also emotionally. I think Lady H um, has the chance to feel young again and, and to maybe refreshed by his energy. Um, so um, I was reminded of this shift, which I think is really interesting from being powerful and ruthless and cold and efficient. There's a point where she feels um, excited again and um, intrigued by this new character and also emotionally involved. So that's quite interesting. And one thing that I found in my my notes um because i kept some very beautifully written notes um, <laughs> um i i really went um deep into research and there was a mention early on about a husband that i don't think we addressed in the show but that was quite i was quite surprised to read about the fact that she's married because i didn't remember that and you don't see it in the show but i like the fact that this is sort of wealthy rich husband in the background that we never see so that, that was quite a surprise to remember that but yeah maybe she also she uses people um so maybe her marriage is based on uh, money and success yeah she has no reserves in using and abusing people to achieve what she wants to achieve yes very good she was a little bit um anna wintour so something of her went into her, what's her, i remember with the glasses and everything and just yes. that kind of power uh, artistic power that she has yeah. yeah so let's move on to one of my favorite characters of all time <laughs> Cyril Vane, Chris <laughs> <Army>. <laughs> um, <laughs> tell us about Cyril. Cyril was the most fun to play. Really a pretty vile person. Uh, he was based on uh, a very shallow actress in the original novel, Sybil Vane, who played Juliet um, and Dorian became infatuated with, with her uh, as an actress. In, uh, in our version, Cyril is a narcissistic, uh, self-obsessed ballet dancer who's playing Romeo, 
when uh, Dorian uh, and Lady H take a trip to, to the ballet. And uh, Dorian falls in love from the auditorium with the uh, dancer that he sees on stage, um, but not necessarily knowing what kind of person he is in real life. There's a brilliant uh, quote, I don't know if I'm getting this completely right, but that Oscar Wilde wrote for Sybil. And she says something like, sometimes I'm so clever that I don't understand a word of what I'm saying. <laughs> and I always remember that and I thought it was so brilliant because that was exactly Cyril. He just judged on aesthetic. Mm. And um, after, after Cyril does his performance, he, he, there's a really quick change and the set revolves and he leaves the stage door and Dorian's waiting, which is very out of character for Dorian to sort of be a stage door Johnny. And, um, and he gives Cyril his card and Cyril sort of takes it and looks his card and then looks at Dorian and kind of looks him up and down. And I remember always in, at that moment thinking, you know, Cyril's thinking, I don't date actors. You know, but then straight afterwards, he walks past this billboard that um, Dickie was talking about, and realizes that that um, Dorian is actually a model and is quite a successful one, and it's the reason that he he starts the the relationship. It's the shallow thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you saying, I always tell this story, but I remember you, one of your character, when you tell us all about your character, you said that he was the only person who was who ever to be the Dancing Times Dance of the Month two months running. <laughs> ah. I should have said twice in the same month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Drew, tell us about your experience of creating characters within this piece and feeding into the story in that way. Yeah, so um, like you said, you know, it was quite a small company and um, that was indeed, like you say, really thrilling and, and a big part of why the company bonded so quickly. Um, what was really exciting about being part of the small company was uh, the ensemble um, really had a very important part to play in uh, showing the change in the world. I mean, I think that a lot of the work that New Adventures does in involves the ensemble in a way that a lot of other uh, shows don't and that is that they have a real impact into the narrative importance of the show and I think Dorian is a really perfect example of that in, in quite a focused and specific way and um, we as uh, as an ensemble um, were played you know played a huge range of characters from photographers to um, models to uh, people that were um, kind of really kind of pulling upon Dorian's attention. But really what was very interesting about the way that the ensemble was, was used within Dorian was actually you could see the decay of the hunger within the ensemble and how ultimately um, the, 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 the kind of need for Dorian's attention and indeed the kind of mutual love of the attention wanted by Dorian and, and, the, and ultimately ultimately led him to his demise. And so, you know, we, we as, a, as an ensemble start off being, you know, the collectors of art, as it were, you know, we actually start off as models, as, as people that are enjoying beauty. And then you very had this really, really quick change into the gallery, which is like sprinting, throwing clothes on, getting on stage with a revolving set. And then we very quickly become the kind of, um, the people that were admiring art. And a little interesting thought uh, within that context was that the way that the show was structured was that we started off as models, we were being photographed, then those photographs were then projected onto Leslie's set and then we became the admirers of ourselves and so the ensemble kind of whipped from being the observed to being the observer and it was it was quite an electric moment for the ensemble again because the ensemble are rarely celebrated in the way that New Adventures celebrates them and then we were kind of it was the act of us a, a kind of seeing our our image is blown up and and then so what was really nice was the ensemble journey no matter what part we played um started off with the idea of admiring ourselves and then kind of launched through this whole this ever darkening path down to my my last moment on I, I started off being celebrated as a model and my last moment on stage was as a photographer um bursting into the apartment to photograph the, the deceased body of Dorian and the hunger so the kind of the idea of this ignition of of um of fame of youth of beauty and how that ever you know that's that that's you cannot um, satisfy that hunger and that need until 
um, innocent people die. So it was, um, you know, there's, there's many different individual characters I played uh, along the way. My most significant and, and uh, traumatizing thing was actually a Cyril's understudy. And I say that as a man who wishes to never be put in white tights or do anything classical over the shape uh -huh. of my legs and feet. And covering Chris was a, a hugely traumatic experience for me, one that I'm still recovering from. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, like uh, as an ensemble, um, we played many different roles, but each of them was in it was utilizing the way to deeper understand um, Dorian's hunger and need for attention. And we kind of played that character as a collective. I like the way you say, I think you will go on a journey as well. It's very easy to plot your journey through it. Um, mm. as starting off as, you know, the, the, in a way his, his, it's mirroring his journey a little bit as well, isn't it? Mm. Massively. Uh, being glamorous models and, and being, you know, and then gradually sort of that disintegration uh, that seems to occur towards the end and even end up, uh, some of you even end up seemingly uh, killed by him. Mm. I think it, we all it, were, yeah. yeah. More or less, and so sort of metaphorically in some ways, but also literally in some ways, mm. we, don't, we don't really give that away, I suppose, uh, whether it's a real thing or not, but it's, you know, you, you, you actually end up being killed by him, which is great, I think. Great journey to go on. Mm. So I wanted to touch on a little bit. Um, I realised that I'm looking back on my notes this morning. Um, I was going to, thinking about workshops leading up to this. We did quite a lot. We did quite a lot of things. And I think mm -hmm. I was talking last week about Edward Scissorhands. And I realised that we, we'd done quite a lot of stuff beforehand, but didn't come to, to the rehearsals with much. We didn't have actually material to work with very much. And I learned a lot from that. And having only five weeks to rehearse when we did Edward. And realizing that we're, what were all those workshops about? And I think we, we learned a lot and we actually did do quite a lot in advance. But we also, a couple of years before, we did a workshop called Romeo Romeo, which wasn't for Dorian specifically, but ended up being um, a lot about Dorian and a lot about male uh, duets and male partners. And it was a, it was a, a workshop that, that I ran with six men. Uh, and based on male duets to see how far we could take them in a romantic way, in a sexual way, and playing with that. I think it was a really uh, uh, brilliant week, actually. Three of you, you know, you, you three guys were all there. I wonder if you had any thoughts about that initially. And then I was gonna just talk, uh, when you talk a little bit about inhibitions and things, because this was a show that really um, explored people's uh, sexuality, and I know a lot of our workshop involved that, uh, workshopping involved that. And it was, I felt, we felt we were doing something a little bit pushing the boundaries when we were mm. making it. Matt, I just, when you were saying that, I remember that, um, and I think this was done on purpose, that the workshops were taking place in one of the really small studios at Sabah's World. So it felt very intimate. And yeah. that the days were from four or three in the afternoon to 9 p.m. to really, you know, to, to change our focus in a way, to maybe um, to maybe open us up to, to talking more as well. Uh, yeah, which is... I thought we could turn the lights out a bit as the day went on. <laughs> yeah. Lots of bright sunlight doing sort of mm. duets with those sexual themes and things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember really specifically that another thing, um, which obviously is uh, about the inhibitions and so on, but also just a little bit of voice of, of kind of equality in there is that the, the, the makeup of the, of the six gents that were being part of the workshop were three people that identified as a homosexual and three that identified as heterosexual. And the, and the, you know, this was, this was a while ago. I mean, this was a couple of years before Dorian happened. So you've got to think this is what, like 12 years, 10 years ago or something like this is a long time ago. And, um, and the idea that there was a group of men that uh, were sitting in a room and talking about their experiences of gender and the way that their, their sexuality, their identity, um, their, their sexual identity, um, and how that plays into the iconography of two men together and what the power play of that is. And, and that discussion went from the very physical strength attributes of men of different shapes, weights, you know, but also the actual power play that is inherent within sex. And, um, you know, I'll just never forget, you know, essentially, so there's, there's the one topic of conversation which is running to further um, the creative process. But there's another one of, of like profound trust building and, and, and a kind of an inquisitive nature into kind of intimate subjects of power, which obviously 
you can see how that translates then into a story like Dorian Gray. But, you know, I'll never forget sitting with James Lease, um, who is a married man with children. And we were choreographing a duet set to actually the Prokofiev of Romeo and Juliet music. And um, we were just getting on with tasks, creative tasks. And we were trying to work out whether the actual kind of penetration moment would happen on the three or the four. And then kind of actually having a conversation where James would sit there and say, yeah, but what, because of course, I mean, you know, this is, it's, it's you know, obviously we're getting into the nitty gritty there, literally. But the, um, the, the aspect of it, having a, uh, providing a platform, providing an environment in which you can actually feel heard and your experience as a minority group can be valued and, and met with such open hearted creativity was incredibly impactful. And my one other thing to say about those Romeo Romeo workshops was just the, um, I remember we were all working on tasks and, you know, it was, it was beautifully fluid, constant, supportive. But the moment that um, uh, Dickie and Aaron danced together, it was like electric and it was just something that was like, you can rehearse forever and you can ask 700 questions and you can have a rigorous process, but there is something chemical when, um, when two great dancers and two great actors are given the opportunity uh, and the support system in which to truly fly. That it was, I just remember we were doing the task with and, and um, Dickie and Aaron went last. And it was a bit like, that's the end of the day then. You know, <laughs> you got, what do you say about it? Like, it, and it was, it was really thrilling. Yeah, it was really <laughs> thrilling. Look, I think we went into that, didn't we? Find, trying to find a language for it. Trying to find a language for two men dancing together, making it, um, making it seem right and like Drew was saying, fluid and real and passionate and all those things. And I think technique had to fly out the window. We, we didn't look at, there was, there was no like, different shows. You have kind of a, a contemporary technique or a ballet technique or something. There was just, there was no technique. And now that's not to say that there was no dancing. The dancing was visceral and improvised almost. And certainly with the duet that Aaron and I started, I just remember kind of, um, because I think we, we started, didn't we? We kind of started with body contact and started yeah. with a lot of kind of well, feeling. Tricky. I remember setting tasks at the beginning of the week, trying to just start very simply, no, nothing emotional, yeah. and just sort of taking weight and stuff. And you kept all looking in each other's eyes and thinking, <laughs> you sort of knew what the task was, where it was going. Yeah. And you actually were a bit ahead of me, I felt. But you created the energy and the atmosphere that we are, like Drew was saying, that we were allowed to express and explore. Yeah. And it was a safe place. And I think that's the most important thing in creating a piece is it has to be a safe place. And I think the minute that Aaron and I started on, I don't know what the start of it, I think it was just come up with what, four counts of eight of moving each other, lifting and kind of, you know, feeling the kind of a passion. And I just started to flow in an improvised way. And it was almost trying to, we were ahead of ourselves trying to remember what we just did because mm -hmm. it wasn't really a technique of that's a step, that's a count, that's a count. There was no counts. There was no, um, it was just, visceral that's all anywhere can explain it um, and I think that's a really beautiful way of starting a piece like starting a certainly a duet um, I think a lot of it went into the Dorian didn't it at the end a lot of stuff very much so. that week did go up it did end up in the show yeah and I remember being in the studio with you Matt and Aaron um, for you know a whole evening just piecing all our kind of ideas together yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and we did the same of, with Cyril, actually. Cyril yeah, and, and the same with exactly the same with Cyril, and just finding a kind of um, a structure to it, and all yeah. those kind of, We had almost had too, too many oh. ideas. It was it was it was bizarre, wasn't it? It just kind of felt it kind of was an overflow of um, yeah of, of movement. It was it was also very progressive because um, we removed gender. You know, even back then, we were removing gender from what we were doing. Uh, one of the tasks was to see, you know, take existing male-female partnering material and seeing if uh, two men can achieve that. And, and those were really contrasting pieces of choreography that we were given, you know, from the classical ballet to um, Fred Casting in the dark. Yeah. Um, and, and actually what happened was we, re we realised that it was all completely achievable you know, in a different, sometimes in a different way of getting to the final outcome, but we, you know, it was, it was possible. And I think that's where the hope was. Some of those big lifts, Chris, so I was getting you up onto my shoulder and all that. Yeah, yeah. We, did, um, we did male, female film scenes as well, that we then did yeah, yeah. dances. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, that was a, a good exercise. So I'm sorry, Chris, that I gave you and Aaron 
yes. scene from Don't Look Now to Learn. You didn't really know each other at the time, did you? No. <laughs> this is Aaron Zillis, by the way, folks, who's not here, who was the original Basil um, in, this, in this show. Um, but I gave you this very intimate sex scene to learn from a film called Don't Look Now. And you very diligently <laughs> became Julie Christie and Donald Sutherland for me. <laughs> Wasn't it the longest sex scene in a movie for the time? <laughs> famous one, yeah. It's famously very intimate between a husband and a wife, actually, isn't I it? Remember that. It's sort of cut away from in different things. And it's, it's a famous scene, but yeah, you did it very well. <laughs> um, Michaela, I feel you're a bit left out here at the moment. Um, no, how did right. you feel? Um, in coming into workshop, we later went into workshops for the actual show, coming into this world of testosterone and duets that had already been <laughs> thought about a little bit. I think we started um, again a bit, didn't we? And did some tasks and things. Yes, I remember doing modelling tasks. So I became a model as well as everybody else, yeah. um, which was great. Um, and sort of entered that world of um, self-obsession, which was still relevant for Lady H. Um, so I remember working on phrases where we were looking at ourselves in the mirror or looking into a camera, looking at the photographer, taking pictures. Um, but um, going back to the, um, the gender, exploring different, you know, same gender duets and, and swapping genders. I remember we started working on a duet with Doria and with Richard. And because I became the sort of the manipulator, I had to think about it as a traditional male dancer in a duet. And I remember that I ended up being behind Dorian behind Richard most of the time and um, I initiating movement and manipulating him and that was the whole point of um, uh, Lady H um, sort of creating you know creating him and um, uh, changing him or, or putting him in the, in the right light in the right position but it was very strange for me to be behind my partner and I realized that all the way through my career I've always performed more traditional duets where the woman is often in front and it was really interesting to be behind and trying to work out where my you know how to be present by being behind <laughs> behind him um and, and that was really uh, really revealing as well for in a way what men have experienced you know as dancers all the way through these years you know because they're often behind they're often lifting um and the the female dancer is usually at the front so that was really uh, revealing yeah it's in the spirit of what we were doing really wasn't it sort of questioning those things, partnering. Yeah. She came from Romeo and Romeo, really. It's another way of looking at how you could swap those roles around if they, if there's someone's instigating everything. Uh, Dickie, that's quite hard for you as well, in a way, wasn't it? You know, being that person. Being yeah, I was always, I was always quite, a, uh, you know, as a younger performer, a younger dancer, I was always quite a big stature, and I was always the one, you know, lifting the woman or the man or whatever, and saying car man or whatever. I was always kind of the bigger guy. Um, and so, yeah, it was a real challenge for me to kind of give myself over, I think, kind of emotionally and physically, both, um, mm -hmm. to, I guess, another guy who was equally strong, who was equally capable of partnering me as I was partnering him. So it was kind of like, I think it added to the, the tension and the drama of the duets, I guess, as well, that kind of male dominance thing, trying to kind of outdo each other and outplay each other, and I guess all those things. But yeah, it was a real... Um, change in, in for me of kind of weight I guess and giving myself uh, um, the ability to be lifted which was quite a challenge. Yeah I think it was something that happens in Swan Lake which had happened obviously some years previously but yeah. not very much in Swan Lake the actual lifting there is some lifting obviously but yeah. I think we, were, we wanted to make it uh, more equality within it I guess. Yeah that's great. Um, my next little thought thing once we you know once we got into workshops and we started putting the show together um, and we were started to tell our story, and you've touched on some of these things already. Um, I wonder, each of you, which uh, section, storytelling-wise, was a surprise or appealed to you in a particular way in, in, the, in the structure of the piece? Do you have a sort of favourite section that, that was sort of interesting to create? Maybe. When you said about kind of the, the bit of storytelling that was a surprise, I think it kind of relates back to a previous thing that you asked of us, which is... Um, 
which is about the inhibition side of things. I mean, you know, I joined the company a few years before Dorian had happened. And I remember when I got uh, when in discussions about um, taking a role in the car man, I was asked how I felt about onstage nudity. And I was like, absolutely not, never, never going to do it. No, you can't do it. You can't do it. And through the course of like the, um, the and I didn't do it in, in, in the car man. Um, but by the time we got to Dorian, like through the, through the creative process and this idea of kind of slightly bringing down inhibitions and, and, and the kind of study of, of oneself and, and again, that kind of safe environment that everyone's talking about, you know, by the time we're opening Edinburgh, I'm, you know, living my full fantasy as Richard Windsor's lover getting out of bed at the top of act two, completely <laughs> naked. And, um, and a little funny story, actually, I remember, um, that we did a few previews and I'd got out of the bed and, and kind of like, I, you know, I'd get out of the bed, grab my towel, and then I'd turn, walk up stage. And there was always a kind of, like a kind of muffled kind of like, oh, in the audience, oh, naked person, oh, naked person. And I remember kind of like, I just didn't know. I said, just get off stage as quickly as possible. Just, you know, whatever. And I remember Matt, you coming up to me and saying, um, Drew, if you, if you take one step further up stage, sit into your hip, you'll get an applause. And I was like, what? You're like one step further up stage, sit into your hip and see what happens. I did that, that show. I walked up stage. I sat into my hip and like immediate round of applause. And I asked you, I don't know if you remember this. I asked you after, I said, how did you know that was going to happen? And you said, it's because it's confidence. Because at the moment, like when you, the audience don't know whether you're okay. And so basically the moment you turn up stage and you sit into your hip, you're letting the audience know that you as a person are in charge, that you, that you like the attention and the audience are then at ease to be able to say, oh, we applaud your bum, your nudity, whatever. <laughs> and, um, and it was a really interesting lesson for me about, about actual true um, equity on stage and, and um, where a lot of times people talk about the way that we as theatre makers are kind of like, oh, is it okay to ask somebody to be naked on stage and of course it is like we it's a very we're in a very complicated time at the moment about people feeling at ease with the way that shows are being made and stuff but it's a continual dialogue and if you know we need to create safe spaces and we need to make sure that people feel okay about how they're positioned within a story um but at the same time it's kind of like we can't mute creativity we can't dilute it we can't make it you know overly safe for us we're just telling the same stories so it was just a, a thing i think the surprising aspect for me was was kind of how in tune you were, Matt, with the fact that, like me, I, I had to go that one step further to break down the individual. It's one thing saying, "Yeah, well, I'm confident enough now to get into bed naked with Richard Windsor and get out and stand on Sadler's well stage and show them my bum." Um, it's a different thing for you to truly take equity, tr truly to take take power of the moment. And um, and that kind of lesson was it was again chemical, like it was. So I think the surprising thing for me was the personal growth, which is not just about the growth within Dorian Gray. It's the growth between me joining the company at 19 years old and, and kind of through gentle, safe, continued focus and support uh, from an artistic director leads me to a place where I fully understood uh, understood basically the power of, of breaking down inhibition. So it, it, I'm not sure that answers your question very articulately in terms of specifically in storytelling, but it was maybe the most surprising moment for me and related to a, a slightly comedic thing and, um, and yeah, relates to the kind of inhibition thing. Thank you, Drew. So Drew's favourite part of the show was showing his bum to the audience. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> what about you, Chris? Um, so the end of act one was my favourite part that wasn't necessarily uh, about dancing, it was all choreographed acting. Um, but uh, it's a scene where um, after only very few months, um, Cyril had moved in with Dorian into his loft and uh, he comes in through the doors after a performance of I Dare, that was what was in my head. And there's all of these uh, friends of Dorian lying around drunk, passed out and, and he kind of just, just lords his way in, dumps his bag, throws his jock strap out the window, you know, hangs his wet pipes up over Dorian's beautiful picture and uh, slides down into the splits and has some water. And on the table, he sees um, these pills. And obviously he's got terrible migraine from the performance. So he takes the pills thinking they're Nurofen or something, but in fact, they're ecstasy tablets. Dorian's been having this um, party. And uh, the scene that ensues is the end of act one. And, it's it's um, Dorian watching Cyril die and um, and not making an intervention. So he 
the um, turning point. Away, yeah, yeah. Cr crawl, crawls across the floor over the bed, reaches for the telephone, I think, which Dorian then rips out the wall. Yeah. Um, and then end of that one is uh, Cyril um, dying in full Juliet pose over the edge of the bed as if she's in the tomb. Um, and then that's not actually the end, is it? Because the doppelganger appears. But hmm. Yes, we have a doppelganger in our piece. So as yes. soon as uh, Dorian does something really evil, which is sort of letting Cyril die and without helping him and knowingly does it, uh, his doppelganger appears, which is not in the, really in the novel. It's sort of suggested a little bit in the novel, um, who becomes his sort of evil twin and is these, he becomes his sort of conscience. And throughout the second half, he sort of follows him around. He look, looks very similar to him. Yeah, he's like a conscience. And I was at, I, I like that idea because it was something original for our show that came to our show as the doppelganger thing. And uh, I'd read somewhere that a doppelganger is someone who follows you around behind you, they're always behind you. And the, mo the moment you turn around and actually make eye contact with them is the moment of your death. Mm. And that's, that's when you see yourself in a way. Mm. I don't know, it's a, it's a nice concept, but I think we use that in the piece. Dickie? Yeah, I mean, similar to Chris, I think that would, that would be my. Uh, it was, it's the point of change, I think, for Dorian. It's the kind of the, the, the switch in him that kind of goes from this uh, vain sociopath to psychopath, basically. And yeah, it's a good so, acting moment, isn't it? Really beautiful uh, acting moment, yeah. yeah. It's a real kind of change. The audience, I think, you know, are, are kind of rooting for Cyril, but even though they, they're annoyed by him, I think the, the audience just, you know, starting to despise Cyril. Um, but still, um, they don't quite realise what's going to what's going to happen. So they kind of think, go on, help him, help him, help him. And he, Dorian just basically makes that decision really quickly and just stares at him and everything is going on internally. Nothing else needs to happen. It's just still um, dis distaste for this, this human and deciding just to let him expire. And I think it's just such a powerful turning point for Dorian as a character. And it allows him to kind of, um, bathe in that kind in, in that kind of glory of of being depraved and, and disgusting and it goes into act two and it's the start of his demise obviously it's a kind of power as well isn't it and it's just a horrible horrible moment but really powerful theatrical moment yeah. um, and I really felt the audience wow. seeing it all through my eyes I think which is a really nice feeling so they were kind of feeling what I was feeling what seeing what Cyril was feeling and it was just a horrible but beautiful moment I agree yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I have to say my favourite were the, the seduction scene in Act One. So when um, at a party, uh, Dorian ends up in my bedroom. Well, first, before the party, there's the dressing scene, um, all done on percussions. Um, and we worked a lot on creating tension through very minimal amount of movement in a way minimal sort of acting it was all based on nuances and tension so it's not a very obvious seduction scene to start with and it just grows and grows in tension um i just loved how detailed we had to be with our um glances and and gestures and um, and it sort of, it was very challenging um, throughout the whole process for this character, the Lady H, it was personally, it was really challenging to hold back and, and as a dancer, you tend to express your emotions and feelings through movement and through dance. And that's the first pl place you go to. That's how you access emotions. But I had to sort of pull back and go in the opposite direction of sort of holding back, being very... Um, sort of stern and steel and controlled and and that was very challenging and it was sort of we discovered also how um being minimal about gestures and movement worked really well for yeah. the character and i think i resisted it for a while um and then once i sort of embraced it uh, those scenes were were amazing because they were incredibly challenging it was about going you know deep to the essence of the scene and remove all the fluffy bits or the you know unnecessary things and um, and equally in act two is another 
uh, scene um, with Lady H and Dorian. Again, it starts from a very familiar place. Dorian often goes to Lady H's house and then it escalates into something completely unexpected and sort of throws Lady H into a very unfamiliar, unknown territory of being sort of abused. And, um, and again, there was so little music um, to it as well that it created these beautiful silences and and um, you know gazing at each other was even you know more meaningful because we didn't have an underscore all the time. Terry's music to those two scenes was really fantastic to play with. Mm. Just very sparse yeah. percussion, wasn't it? But it said so yeah. much. The science said yeah. so much, and yeah, I loved it. I love those. I love that music, mm. and I love those scenes. Yeah, yeah. Really, really memorable. I was wondering whether, just a, a little discussion with all of us about, um, this piece was made in 2008. Um, mm. It was made in the present day. Do we feel, well, a couple of things. Do we feel that it's um, still resonant today, the themes of it? Do we feel it's dated in any way? Is it a revivable piece now? Would it need to be reworked in some ways and others not, you know, to, to perform the piece today? What, do you, what are your feelings on that? I think, I think with, um, <clears throat> cause that was kind of the start really of social media, I think 2008, 2006, seven, eight was kind of, it was kind of getting there. It was kind of, but now where we're at with social media, with Instagram and with kind of the obsession with uh, beauty and with uh, fake lives and profile and all these different things, I think um, it really shines a light on the piece back then, but would, would do so right now of kind of the grotesque, um, mm. inner workings of trying to pretend to be something you're not, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, catfish, that thing. Catfish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But also just kind of the obsession with yourself, yeah. even though it's not necessarily real. And I think that's for something like Dorian Gray is, you know, he's becomes obsessed with fame and adulation and is it real? Is it not? We don't really know. And it, sh it can be pulled from under you at any point. Um, and I think it really does shine a light and it would do now. So I think it would be um, workable for sure now as a, as a piece. I think the look of the show as well would still be really, really relevant because it was all monochrome, you know, we're all greys, blacks and whites. And, and um, you know, I'm think, I was thinking about the colour in the show and I think the only colour really was the, the red of the blood on our bodies or in the picture. <clears throat> There yeah. was very little colour about it. And I think anything still that is, you know, that vivid is, feels up to date. Yeah. I also feel that nowadays the sort of, the show deals very much with um, uh, mental health and um, issues of mental health. And nowadays we're so much more aware of it that it would um, resonate, I think, even more. Um, but yeah, the, the social media, um, I think, is so present and sometimes I feel everyone lives with a doppelganger, you know, because we have this social media persona yeah. that yeah. doesn't necessarily correspond to who we are and, and sometimes it exists whether you want it or not, you know, once you've created this profile. Um, and also people start addressing you there. There's this other persona that you're not always, you haven't always made decisions for you, but it's there. Also the things that people project on you, um, whether you like it or not. And I think is a bit like having a doppelganger <laughs> next to you all the time. Obviously the, the huge themes that run through it are, are, are massively relevant. Um, and uh, the, I, I think that, you know, if, the question would be whether you wanted to, visually uh, show the, the, t the technological advances since then. So, and I guess that that would just be a creative choice as where I was saying previously, the ensemble were used to kind of monitor the growing hunger from the public um, and what that does, whether, whether the act of essentially giving all of those characters mobile phones, whether that, that visually from a dance perspective makes you dissing, oh, Michaela's on the side. Um, you know, whether, uh, whether, whether the visual storytelling attached to a, a baying mob that is, a, that is expressing through something, whether that 
potentially weakens and takes the thrill away from the emotional arc of the ensemble and the kind of hunger or whether there's a way of um using it to amplify the the kind of growing hunger you know it would be as a as a design uh, because there was projected elements within it and um, it would be very I could imagine very easy to implement kind of shared screens and stuff in this space. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the story stands true personally. I think it's still dealing with the things that have only been amplified since it was made. Um, I think all the characters are brilliant representations. I don't think there's anything culturally problematic with the representation of the people within it. I think it's incredibly modern. Like Chris was saying, the aesthetic of it is incredibly timeless and modern. And I guess for me, the question would come to whether you think it's necessary to show the advancements of technology, whether that furthers your emotional um, understanding of the story or whether it distances it from you. Yeah, I do feel a bit that I, my view on it is that yes, I think the characters still work. They're very classic characters in a way. I think what we'd have to do is update some of the design elements that were very specific to that year, like the, the, um, the Damien Hirst skull and things mm -hmm. like that, which we, we seemed incredibly now when we did it. Yeah. Yeah, I always think a piece of set in the present is that it dates the quickest. So most of our new adventure shows are in a timeless kind of world of the past some, somewhere. Um, and they, they come up quite fresh each time you do them because they're sort of cla they're classic. And I think in this piece, there was an attempt to make it a classic piece, if that makes sense mm -hmm. to you, what I'm talking about, uh, that, it, that these, are, these are characters that could be in any time almost. And a look, I think there was a look there, you're right, the, white, the black and white with the red standing out, the blood and things like that. Uh, very classic again. Uh, but just a few changes, maybe a few musical changes and things as well, I think, just to make it feel like now, now, mm -hmm. you know, whenever it's made again. I think a little bit of work from the team, the creative team on what they still feel happy about and what they would change. And I think it is doable. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, do, I agree. I had a little um, uh, question for each of you before we sort of wind up a little bit, just to sort of um, home in on something. Uh, so Chris, you're first. Uh, I was gonna ask, um, how close is the character of Cyril Vane to you personally? How much of yourself <laughs> did you bring to it? Same, <laughs> same technique. <laughs> Technique. Oh yeah. Same technique. Um, no, I mean very little. I would, you know, he was a, a self-obsessed narcissistic ballet dancer, which I hope none of my colleagues think that I was. So, <laughs> um, no, 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 no. glorify a bit in being that person, though. I think you enjoyed. Oh, it was. That. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I mean, in, in the start, it was like you know, because a lot of people say, oh, it's really difficult to play you know, some your own career. So it's hard to play an actor, it's hard to play a dancer. But actually, the way Cyril started was such a stereotype that it was a lot of fun and that the kind of un vulnerable aspect of him came came later. So before the death, just, just at the end, <laughs> um, yeah. he showed a vulnerable side to himself. So um, no, of course, there are aspects that you've, that it, that I felt like I could pull from, and many characters that I had met who I could associate with certain mm. parts of Cyril. Yeah, I think it's. The, I think the thing I was getting at really is that you, I think you understood the character, not that they were like you. Yeah, there was a character you completely knew and understood, mm. um, and and an, an enjoyable character to play in that respect. I loved it. <laughs> so Michaela my question to you was um, you, until we went to Japan you were the only person ever to play Lady H you did all the performances I think 155 <laughs> shows on the two tours we, you had a cover but your cover was a man I think yeah. and I remember Ashley Bain being your cover Ashley on, Bain on he was cover, anyway. yeah we didn't we, we felt we almost rehearsed we did actually rehearse it in that way to see if it was possible um, but we didn't have a, an available woman to do it, I don't think. But how, it just seems to how, how do you feel? Because you played so many roles in New Adventure shows. They're all quite different. How was this one different mm -hmm. for you and what your challenges were? And my other question was, who would you get to play the role today if you were not available? Yes. Um, <laughs> so impossible. It was yeah, impossible. Um, no, if I, um, it was very challenging. I, in hindsight, I think what was challenging was the fact that it was a contemporary piece. So I couldn't hide behind a 40s wig or a 60s wig, or I couldn't, you know, create this completely different persona that I've done in other shows. It was very much contemporary. So... 
Um, it had to feel real. It felt harder in a way. I couldn't, you know, research the eras and come up. It was, it was very much researching nowadays. Also, I worked very much on my own on that show. I didn't have someone that I created the role with. And sometimes it's really important to have someone else to discuss your ideas with and, and you get inspired by another performer and you get to watch the show and see the overall thing. And I didn't get that chance until I watched some archive recording of it. Um, so I had a specific image in my head about the show from the inside but not from the outside um, but then when I watched it again recently I was very um, pleasantly surprised I really enjoyed it <laughs> um, no I thought it was brilliant um, I would definitely make myself free to come back and do it again I wouldn't let <laughs> anyone else do it <laughs> um, no I think it would be really interesting to have a man do it just because we explore the idea and I was excited when I watched Ashley Bain doing it in rehearsals I thought this could really work and it just you know created a completely different dynamic and so I think it would be good to explore that option and in terms of someone else doing it I would have to leave it to the master of casting Matthew Bourne because <laughs> um, I can't quite can't quite make that decision it would be up to you fair enough Michaela fair enough well I'm sure you're <laughs> me next to it. Uh, indeed. <laughs> yeah. I'll uh, drop everything. Absolutely. Of course you will. Um, Drew, my question with you was, it, I, people may not know that, uh, about more recent bands, you had quite an extensive career with New Adventures in the early part of your performing career. did quite a few shows with us. Um, and they've since gone on to be a brilliant choreographer in the West End on Broadway. Um, and now film coming up soon, a, new, a film you're choreographing, which is fantastic. Um, I just wondered, at this earlier part of your career, what, what do you take away from, from helping to create a show like this? Uh, rather than just the work and stuff, but when you're involved in the creation, what, what did you take with you from this that maybe has influenced some of what you've done since? One of my favourite experiences of my entire performing career, and cannot go uh, unmentioned on a call about Dorian Gray, was our first preview um, we'd, had a, we'd had quite a complicated technical process and the show, uh, for anyone that hasn't seen it, um, the design is quite reliant on a revolve where the set constantly keeps moving and there's entrances and exits based on that. And we had quite a complicated technical process um, because the revolve had, had uh, failed us a few times and there's many the times where we hadn't been able to run costume changes and we went out determined as a company that um, we still wanted to do the performance on the first preview. So we went into our first preview performance. Um, I, think it, I think we had done the show before. It was sad because, anyway, I can't quite remember the exact geography, but I remember, um, I talk about it all the time um, in, in any show, like, I, I, I think even if people who now follow my work because of the choreography I do, um, if they didn't know my association with New Adventures, certainly people who work with me in the studio know a lot about my association with New Adventures. I talk about it a lot. And I often talk about this particular preview um, where we hadn't got a dress rehearsal in and we decided as a company that we still wanted to give the performance. And that show, that, that preview performance is perhaps the thing that I miss most about dancing because it not only took a group of artists that were at the top of their game um, when it comes to solving problems, but it, it, was a, it was a true company in that it required the trust of every single person in the company to pull the show off that night. And it was a, it was a united belief in the show's director that we were safe, that we were ready, and that we, um, that we had all the tools available to us to pull off the show. And it's something that I've tried to recreate um, in every production I've ever done since, where you realize that the value of your steps, the value of your story is nothing if the value of your company and the, and the united feeling of that does not stand strong in the moment where, where you might need it. And I remember, Matt, when we were doing um, a karma and I asked you if you missed dancing. And you said, I don't miss dancing. I just miss part, I miss being on stage with people. And I remember at the time going, oh, I don't, I, you know, oh, well, that's the way I never thought about that. Um, and it's something I deeply, deeply feel now is, is what I miss most about, you know, I've loved this Q&A because it's made me feel part of, um, you know, part of dancers again, not in the way, not that I don't now, but that, 
that feeling of feeling united in that the show must go on the, the the feeling that we are ready because of the way that our creative team have prepared us and i um i remember getting through that show i don't remember getting through the show i don't remember anything that happened about the show because it was literally just go 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 it was people throwing glasses at each other catching jackets going on half dressed like completely re choreographing how boxes were coming on stage chucking people cameras it was the most creatively alive i've ever felt live in the moment and it took all of the workshops, it took all of the preparation, all of the detailed research to be able to deliver to the audience a truthful performance. And I will never forget the bowels of that, of, of like, we were insane. We were absolutely kind of like children gone crazy backstage. <laughs> the bowels happened. And then I think we stayed like on stage, side stage for about 25, we were so high because we pulled off the show and you came backstage, Matt, and it was just, it's something I miss um, greatly. And it's something, that, yes, of course, there's all the hundreds of creative things that I took from New Adventures and process, creative process. But the thing that I, I think impacted me the most, and I think that story about Dorian Gray is perhaps the, most, the purest version of that, is a sense of creative leadership that led to such a sense of confidence that we were, we were unbreakable as a company. And it's something that I try to create in every single one of my companies since. Well, thank you, Drew. It's a two-way thing, though. I mean, it's, um, I often feel, uh, as someone who isn't on stage now, that I rely so much on the people that work with me to make it work, you know, and the trust that I have in the, in the people that are in the piece to pull it off. And you're so thankful for it, you know, when you've got brilliant people who are quick thinkers. And um, I always remember Sam Mendes saying to me years ago, you know, the, one of the biggest skills that he felt he had was casting. Um, he said, if you've got the right cast, the right people in the right roles for a play, he was sort of more or less 60% of the way there in yeah. terms of direction, because they were so right for the parts, that it's sort of that you knew that they were going to be good in it. You know, you knew that they understood it and they were going to make it happen. And I thought, well, that's very, very, very true. And, you know, I, mean, I do like casting. I do enjoy casting and see it, thinking who might be good for what in different roles and things, different shows. Um, but it is, it's a combined thing. And often, I, I remember Play Without Words was a bit like that. Uh, I had to go to everyone at the National and say, I don't you guys remember that you were there, uh, um, two of you, um, that, uh, and will you do the show tonight? We hadn't quite finished tech. It was a similar situation, a similar euphoric feeling at the end of it. And they all pulled it off and they made it work, you know, and it, it happened. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Oh, the last audience time. loved it. You know, we didn't even know whether it was funny or whether it was any good or anything at the time. Mm -hmm. we just thought, you know, this, and I remember Will Kent coming up and just sort of hugging me a bit from behind because he knew I was stressed. <laughs> and I got that little gesture, you know, a, a sweet gesture of just sort of, we'll do it for you, we'll calm down, we'll, we'll do it. You know, it is, it's brilliant when that happens, of course. Um, Dickie, just to finish up with you, um, this was such a big uh, moment for you, a big creation for you. And we worked on it together for a long time leading up to it. Sometimes just the two of us in a studio and uh, lots of research and stuff. Um, I just wonder, just reflecting on it now, you know, what, uh, how, what it meant to you, um, how much of uh, the character of Dorian did you identify with yourself? Mm. Um, uh, not to say that you're a sort of murderous, nasty figure that sort of ends up killing a lot of people at the end. Um, but, you know, how much, what did you identify with it and how, how did it, the whole um, experience feel to you? Yeah, I mean, I think it was just such a privilege um, early on. I remember you like discussing it with me. I mean, I was still really young in the company. I'm probably about four years in, I think. We'd just done maybe Play Without Words, I think, um, maybe before it was his hands even, maybe during it was his hands, but really early on. And, I remember you saying, I really, I've got an idea to do Dorian Gray um, and I really want to discuss it with you. And we sat down and discussed it and, and I didn't think it was going to happen or I kind of thought, are you, you know, are you sure or are you you're not? But you were really kind of clear and it's like, I think you'd be great and I think we can really create something very, very good. And then what, four or five years later, we started looking at it. And, um, and I think for me, it was just a privilege to be given such an opportunity to to delve in, I think, as, a, as an actor and a dancer um, and really kind of get my teeth into a role uh, with research with you and with discussions on character with you um, and really kind of um, 
develop him, develop the character, a modern day version as well, not just a restoration Victorian style Dorian that's been done before, a modern look at a character that's so deep and so, um, uh, I don't know, grotesque in every, in every way. But I don't, I wouldn't say I, 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 I personally feel any part of, of I, I think I got, I got to the end of the, um, the whole process and thinking he's everything I hate about humanity, Dorian. He's literally everything I hate, but I've loved playing him. And I think for me to take away from that was um, a real eye-opening um, experience as an actor, I think, and dancer, both. But as an actor, just kind of saying, you can really play horrible, horrible characters and really find something within yourself through research as well, through, through storytelling with you um, and kind of come out the other end and be fine and... <laughs> back to normal. Um, and I remember I think the first six months of, of doing it, doing playing him, um, I remember being somewhat different to myself. I wouldn't say I'm the kind of performer who takes the role home with me all the time, but certainly for Dorian, I think I did a little bit. Um, and I think I felt like I slightly lived him a little bit. And maybe that represent, like, maybe I kind of was different around other cast members during the show early on. I would say it kind of waned towards the end, but um, maybe a different style of company member. I don't know what, but I felt it. And it was quite a harrowing experience in that way. But the best thing about performing, the best thing about acting, you can leave it behind. And coming away from it, I would say I, he, as a character, is the worst thing I can imagine humanity to be. So I think that would be it. <laughs> it was a privilege. It was a massive privilege. It's a bit like, it's a bit like Kristen, where you, you understood him, but you didn't... Um identify with him as such you know it's, no, it's a different thing yeah and it's also it's a, it's a job of acting and i i yeah. think um one of the things that um we often get asked in q and a's and things in, in, in with new adventures with lots of young dancers and uh, who follow us you know is is how how do you get to be a new adventures dancer how do you get to be in this company i think listening to you guys today is is it's very clear what you need to be to be a new adventures performer there's a lot of extra things other than just the dance technique that go into it the re the research the thought process um the delving into yourself as people uh, the acting the um the creation of a character all these things um have become so important in our work and i think uh, i hope people uh, will have listened and learned a little bit from what you guys have been saying today it's been brilliant to look back on Dorian Gray, I love doing the show. Um, it was it was great to create something in the present day. We'd never done that before. That was sort of a, a new thing for us. Um, I did have the most incredible cast to work with, um, and that was, um, as I said earlier, makes all the difference uh, when you're creating with people who are all equally creative. And that's another mm -hmm. lesson to everyone out there: don't just stand there with your arms folded and wait to be told what to do. You know, I think we all, you know that we can all share our ideas. And certainly New Adventures is a forum for that. And as, as some of you said, a safe place to, to create and learn things about yourself as performers. Um, so we're gonna finish up there. I th really enjoyed it, everyone. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you, it was brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed that. We're, we're sort of sharing stuff on social media this week. It's our, it's our Dorian Gray themed week. And so if anyone who wants to look at some clips from the show, we've got a few bits and pieces that we're gonna show. Um, we might even show some old rehearsal footage that I found. Mm -hmm. That be interesting. So, so if you don't know the show and you're interested in it and you've become interested in it through hearing what we said today, um, that you can find out more information about it on our website this week and stuff. And hopefully we will do it again one day um, in a revised mm -hmm. version. Um, but until then, and uh, keep watching, keep tuning in, and thank you to, for your being here today, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.